Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thanks for, for joining us for this, this session. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, give you a, a sort of a broad overview of, of where we are in, in terms of uh, next generation vaccines. And, and the good news is the next generation is really happening uh, in front of us, really in, in uh, unfolding. And, and we at Scripps are, are, are pushing uh, a lot of these innovations. Uh, and I'm going to run through uh, some of the work that, that we're doing uh, in collaboration with investigators at Scripps and elsewhere, uh, and really highlight some of the, the challenges uh, and the thinking that goes into uh, how we design and, and uh, prepare vaccines for uh, existing pathogens and emerging pathogens. So just start with a, a really you know, classic example of, of a vaccine. So here's polio vaccine. It's very simple and highly effective, right? So Here's polio, these little virions, if you inactivate them uh, with some fixatives like formaldehyde, uh, you cross-link and, and, and perturb the surface uh, such that it can't infect, but it presents all of the proteins of, of the polio virus that are necessary uh, to generate uh, a strong antibody response. And so uh, this works very well. And here is a nice uh, electron microscopy uh, reconstruction showing where the antibodies, uh, in particular, uh, these yellow antibodies bind on the surface of poliovirus and where they bind is they overlap with the receptor binding site. So these antibodies are listed by almost universally by everyone and uh, poliovirus uh, can't get into the cell because of this. So this is a really nice example. Of course, that doesn't work for a lot of the, the new pathogens and, and other pathogens we're dealing with, um, but the same principles uh, hold. Uh, and one of the reasons, uh, this is another nice example um, of, of why viruses um, or how viruses can use immune evasion techniques or, or avoid uh, immune responses, and that's respiratory syncytial virus. So if you look at the virion here, you can see it's studied uh, by these, these red and, and blue spike proteins. These spike proteins are responsible for, for finding the cells and, and driving the fusion process. Um, now, if you look, it's, it's a combination of both these, what's known as the pre-F or pre-fusion F protein and the post-fusion F protein. Um, the post-fusion F protein is highly immunogenic and immunodominant, uh, and the antibodies that are elicited to the post-fusion aren't effective at neutralizing the virus. You need to hit the pre-fusion target um, in order to make a neutralizing antibody response. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why you can't just present RSV uh, in, the, in terms of a vaccine, because all the antibodies will be biased in the wrong direction. Uh, so this really sort of sets up uh, uh, the, the stage for, for structure-based vaccine design. Uh, and so RSVF, uh, as well as HIV envelope glyc like a protein, which uh, you know, several investigators uh, at Scripps are, are working on. And this involves solving structures iteratively and then adding mutations like disulfide bonds or hydrophobic, uh, pro, uh, hydrophobic amino acids or prolines or other tricks to really arrest and stabilize this pre-fusion confirmation, which is the antigenically, immunogenically more favorable uh, form. So there's a lot of excitement that in, in RSVF, that's gonna be enough uh, in order to bias the immune response correctly. Uh, and HIV, as I'll touch on, uh, just stabilizing the prefusion state of the spike protein uh, probably isn't going to be enough. So, just to, to give you a high-level view of, of how you know we think about and, and how we develop new vaccines, we spend a lot of time uh, collating uh, known data, known structures, uh, and and spend a lot of time in the computer designing proteins, uh, engineering them as I as I showed. To, to be in certain conformations that are very stable uh, and that present the, the epitopes uh, that we want antibodies to target. Uh, as has uh, as, as really been highlighted by the COVID vaccine development, uh, there's a lot of different innovations in delivering delivery modalities. Um, so, you know, there's the classic uh, inactivated vaccines, uh, similar to the polio vaccine, as I mentioned. There's vectored vaccines where you can take adenovector, a different type of virus, and deliver a protein. There's recombinant proteins, as well as uh, most of you know, the, the success, particularly in the, in the RNA vaccines. And then 
we spend a lot of time uh, assessing the different immune responses in, in animal models. Uh, and this is really important uh, because sort of vac vaccinology went from empirical, where you sort of got a phenotype of, yes, it worked, or no, it didn't, uh, to now we use uh, next generation sequencing to look at the entire landscape of, of antibodies that are elicited. We use a lot of structural biology to define the sites that are, that are hit. And from this sort of enriched information, we can go back and, and we can redesign. And so all of these areas are, are areas that, that my lab and, and others at Scripps are really interested in, in accelerating this process uh, because the faster we can design, the faster we can test, and, and the faster we can analyze, then, then we can sort of close that loop uh, quite quickly. And again, the, the RNA-based vaccines are, are allowing us to accelerate uh, quite quickly. So for COVID-19 or, or any of the, the SARS-CoV-2 um, vaccines, the, the first wave of vaccines were really, uh, it was known that the spike protein on the surface was uh, like those other viruses I mentioned, the target of neutralizing antibodies. And uh, basically every different modality that was available uh, was undertaken in, in the vaccine development process. As I mentioned, all of these different ways of delivering the spike. Um, and, and, and it's really a, a wonderful test in, in vaccinology that, that's, that's being borne out uh, in terms of, of what works best. And we know that you know, there's been success with some ad, ad vaccines, uh, inactivated vaccines, and then uh, you know, obviously huge success in, in the RNA vaccines. Uh, so you know, these deliver all of the viral components, these deliver just the spike protein. Um, and so there's, again, like I said, the future of vaccinology is, is really compressing this timeline. Uh, and you can see from, the, from what happened with COVID-19, that, that this can be done actually in, in six to, to 12 months in, in a quite reasonable time frame, as long as we understand what the antigenic target is and uh, how to make the protein stable, uh, like in the, in the cases of, of those others. And so one of the innovations uh, that came out of my lab uh, in collaboration with uh, Barney Graham and, and Jason McClellan was in 2016, uh, we solved the first structure of, of a human uh, coronavirus spike. And this is from a seasonal virus called HKU1. Uh, and having the structure in hand allowed us to do that structure-based design that I alluded to for HIV and, and RSVF. So we had a strong basis for, for the logic of, of programming this, this confirmation. And what we ultimately did after screening lots of different mutations uh, was to introduce these two proline mutations uh, in the fusion machinery. Uh, and this was enough to arrest the confirmation in the prefusion in antigenically desirable form. It also had a, a nice byproduct of when we tried to express the protein with, with the wild type sequence, we got almost no level of expression. We added the two P mutations and here's for both SARS and MERS. You can see a huge increase in, in the expression levels. Uh, and then importantly, when we look at the wild type by using our, our electron microscopy imaging, you can see these rod shaped in, in red, and these are the post-fusion antigenically undesirable. When you add the 2P, it brings you all back to, to pre-fusion. So this allowed um, many of the companies that, that were developing vaccines to incorporate that, those 2P mutations, Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, Novavax, Johnson & Johnson. Um, and there's lots of different data uh, of course, the 2P mutations uh, weren't the only things tested, but they were selected for in the case of Novavax because they got higher expression and, and, and more stability. Uh, and Johnson Johnson had superior uh, immune responses and so on and so forth. Uh, so you can see how pre-existing knowledge and, and, and a lot of the work that was done on other viruses uh, really played into the ability to rapidly generate what turned out to be remarkably effective vaccines uh, against COVID-19. Um, so since then, uh, there's been a lot more unpacked uh, in, in terms of particularly where the neutralizing antibodies bind, right? So most of you probably know now that the receptor binding domain here in purple is the primary target of, of antibodies. There's all sorts of different classes. Uh, Ian Wilson, a uh, colleague of mine at Scripps has solved a number of these structures 
uh, really in real time as they're being isolated. And you can see there are basically four different ways in which you can target the receptor binding domain. Uh, certain ones like class one and two are, are really potent because they they block the the union with ACE two the receptor, uh, but that's they're also quite susceptible to a lot of the variants that are emerging. Um, the class three and four are more resistant to the variants, um, um, and then class four is a potential for cross reactive with other SARS viruses. So a lot of the the work being done now is to make vaccines that are even smaller that that present just the receptor binding domain to immunofocus. Um, of course, the full spike may have other advantages, and, and, and I don't think that the full spike is going away, uh, but this is just an example of how you take the knowledge and you zoom in and, and design the next round. Uh, and then even further, uh, people um, are developing uh, nanoparticle-based vaccines using these engineered um, proteins uh, that form these, these self-assembling uh, arrays. Uh, and the advantage here is if you just uh, immunize with that receptor binding domain alone, uh, you get weak B cell signaling. If you incorporate it into a, this nanoparticle with multiple copies, you get a much stronger B cell response. Uh, and so again, here's where structure was used to design a lot of these, these materials uh, that can be used to now present lots of different antigens in a plug and play format um, and get strong responses against uh, viruses of interest. Um, we're still looking uh, again in real time for new antibodies. Uh, and, and here's just a new uh, antibody uh, structure from our lab showing uh, that there are some antibodies that people generate that actually can bind and avoid the common escape mutations uh, that, are, that are present in the variants. So it suggests that, that maybe you could even uh, create a, an even more focused vaccine on, on this particular epitope and have the advantage that they escape variants. And of course, this antibody can be developed as a, as a therapeutic, um, and Toscana Biosciences is, is doing just that uh, because it's highly potent, it has favorable properties, and it avoids the, the mutations. Um, so just to, to zoom out uh, in, in a few closing slides, uh, again, a lot of the, the logic and, and innovation that has gone into a lot of vaccine design uh, is being driven uh, by the work that, that, that is being done on HIV uh, vaccine development here at Scripps. So in a consortium led by Dennis Burton, we're using lots of different structure-based design to elicit very specific and particular classes of antibodies. Uh, I mentioned that pre-fusion uh, structure of, of, of uh, HIV trimer. This is in humans right now. Uh, so it's the first sort of proof of concept for, for pre-fusion stabilized. Uh, and of course, it's not going to be the, the end of the vaccine development, it's, it's, but it's an important proof of concept. And then another colleague at Scripps, Bill Sheaf, uh, has uh, shown now that you can take, a, again, a, just a small piece of this HIV envelope protein uh, and design it such that you elicit a very particular class of antibody uh, down to the sequence level. So we have sequence level understanding of what people's antibody or immune repertoires look like. Uh, and then Bill and his team are, are designing antigens uh, that, that elicit one particular class uh, of antibodies, which is really remarkable. Uh, and they had uh, quite a success recently in, in, their, in their clinical trial uh, for the first time showing that you could, uh, what they call germline target um, by designing uh, specific um, entities and then immunizing. So. Uh, this HIV remains you know, the, the, the toughest opponent we have, but it, it's forcing us to create new vaccine modalities, innovate, and then uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, innovate in terms of, of the types of assays we use to measure the immune responses, next generation sequencing, high throughput structural biology. And so that's where you know, my lab, uh, again, just to end on a few contributions, here's sort of the, the workflow the classic workflow of, of serology showing, you know, if you immunize a, a, an animal, uh, you can do some preliminary assays um, to, to test for, for binding and, and maybe efficacy. You start to generate monoclonal antibodies and then the structural biology classically comes, uh, you know, many weeks out or months out to years. Um, we have a new assay now in the lab that really allows us to start the structural analysis 
uh, very soon after the immunization to really delineate the, the total antibody response. Uh, and again, so that, that's an important way in which we can iterate uh, quickly. Uh, all this is, is our, a lot of this, the structural work is, is done. Uh, if we were uh, actually having the spectrum in person, we'd be on the Hazen campus, uh, and that's where our, our wonderful cryo-EM facility is uh, with tens of millions of dollars of, of infrastructure and computation that allow us to do this, uh, this amazing work at, at, in real time. That, that's really uh, where our effort is being placed. Um, and we're doing this not just for, for HIV, but we have programs in Ebola, malaria, uh, influenza, coronaviruses uh, as well. And, and so all of these principles can be, can be used across the, the different viruses. Uh, and it's a really nice way uh, to learn something in one field and bring it into another field. And just to end uh, with a really pretty picture, uh, this is basically all the antibodies that, that we've characterized against Ebola glycoprotein. Uh, this was uh, my student Daniel Muren's thesis, and it really does show you the diversity in which antibodies bind uh, mechanisms of neutralization and, and really principles for, for further design of maybe an Ebola-based vaccine. Uh, I mentioned my lab has been doing a lot of work uh, characterizing what antibody responses to seasonal coronaviruses look like. We're now, of course, doing a lot of work uh, to, to SARS-CoV-2 infection and in vaccination. Uh, and then we also uh, solved the structure uh, of the Novavax vaccine using cryoEM. Uh, so cryoEM has really a allowed us to, to take images and pictures of things uh, like vaccines and vaccine formulations uh, like we haven't been able to uh, before. So with that, I will end and, and acknowledge uh, the great team of, of, of people in my lab uh, that of course are, are doing all the, this work, uh, with ger very generous funding from the National Institute of Health, the Gates Foundation, uh, and IAVI, and, and really a lot of internal support uh, from Scripps Research. Uh, and if, uh, you can see this is the last time we were able to get together uh, to take a picture because really this is how um, all the people in the lab are doing research now. So we do this with Zoom as, as you know, but really the, the efforts have been quite remarkable from the scientists, not only in my lab, but across campus. And I'd like to just acknowledge, uh, you know, the, the hardships and, and otherwise that they've had to deal with to, to keep uh, the train moving. And with that, I think I'll end and pass it over to Case. Mm -hmm.